All right, good afternoon. So I wanted to jump into some Renaissance art, and uh, I hope that you will enjoy this, this part of the show. We're going to take a look at some paintings from the pre-Renaissance period, or some, some works of art from the pre-Renaissance period from the, middle evil, the, middle, the medieval age, the late medieval period, the Byzantine period, and then look at this transition that we get in Northern Italy uh, between the 13th and 14th century. And then we'll use that as the jumping off point uh, to further our discussion on the Renaissance art that we're probably more familiar with from, from what we call the high Renaissance. So let's take a look and start with, I've already showed you some of, some of the art from the Middle Ages. We looked at a, a few examples of Gothic architecture and, and we had a, a nice side conversation about uh, stained glass, which we can get back into when we, when we go to Venice. But I wanna take a look at some examples of two-dimensional art. So here we are in the sixth century AD. This is to the, the, the very end of the Western Roman Empire. So here we are in the last capital of the Roman Empire, uh, a town in northeastern Italy called Ravenna. And this is during a period when the Western Roman Empire is in a process of, of gradual collapse, but the Eastern part of the Roman Empire, uh, what will become the Byzantine Empire, uh, is very much in its ascendancy. So the, the, we know that the Roman Emperor Constantine made his, his capital on the Bosporus, the great city of uh, Constantinople, which will eventually become Byzantium, which eventually will become Istanbul. So this is part of a diptych, and the art medium that we're looking at here is mosaic. And I'm sure most of you are familiar with what mosaic is. And maybe you've, you know, as a as a kid when you were doing arts and crafts, you've probably done something like this. So if you put a bunch of colored tiles together and then stand back, uh, you're looking at a mosaic work of art. Most famous example in history is the uh, is the Alexander mosaic. But here we have a Byzantine style, an Eastern Greek style mosaic that we can actually see in Ravenna, Italy. So here we have Empress Theodora. She was married to Justinian. The uh, If we were to look at the other side of this diptych, we would see uh, Justinian and, and his attendants. But there's a couple things that we can point out here that really mark a change. You know, how do I know that I'm looking at something from the Middle Ages as opposed to something from the Renaissance? Well, look at all the faces, especially the attendants on the right. Do you see how they're basically all the same person? Like we, we've almost, we've taken one stock image of a figure and we've cloned it. There isn't much, while there's a lot of variety when it comes to their outfits and the outfits are beautifully adorned, uh, there's very little variety in, in those people. Uh, even the Empress's uh, closest attendants, you know, um, it, the people immediately to her right, it almost looks like they're, they're twins. So there's no attempt at realism or differentiation between the, the people. Um, take a look at their feet for a second. Do you see how they're all standing basically in a line? So because there's no real foreground or background, we would expect a woman like uh, Theodora to be smaller than the male attendants in her retinue. But take a look. The artist is trying to tell us something here. And the artist is telling us that Theodora is the most important person in the painting. And the way that he does that is by making her physically larger than the other people around them. This isn't a trick of perspective because, again, take a look at the feet. So there she is. She is adorned with uh, the most spectacular jewels. She is physically about a half a head higher than everyone else in the, in the mosaic. And uh, there's a, a, uh, a ring around her that we call a halo. So her political importance and also her spiritual importance are being stressed by the artist in the, in the mosaic. Well, beyond stress, it's, it's kind of like he's trying to slap you in the face with it. 
Uh, very little attempt here at actual realism. You know, you wouldn't look at these people and say, this is like a photograph. It's very obvious that it's a picture, a, a, um, an artistic representation. Take a look at the left too. Uh, let me, let me point out the fountain. Is the fountain making anyone anxious? You know, if that fountain were real, the water would be spilling out, wouldn't it? You know, if you're, if, if we're taking a view and there's any kind of linear perspective in this work of art, which there's not, um, we wouldn't be able to see the water in that fountain. We would only be able to see the, the edge of the bowl. But the artist wanted to let us know that that was a fountain. So he used some blue mosaic tile to let us see the water. But it's, it's almost like it's spilling out. Um, so 6th century Byzantine mosaic. We did have a very nice discussion on stained glass last week, so I, I wanted to throw this out here too. This is Notre Dame de la Belle Verrière in, uh, in France. And the same effect is being demonstrated here in stained glass that our Byzantine artist did in Ravenna with the mosaic. This is a depiction of the Madonna. This is a depiction of uh, the mother of Christ, Mary, as Mary, queen of the universe. But take a look at Mary and the way that she's depicted relative to the, uh, the angels and the saints in the stained glass. Mary is gigantic. So the relative importance of Mary is being demonstrated with the halo, with the crown, and with her physical size. This is a Gothic work of art. Now, let's jump ahead to the Proto-Renaissance. Let's jump ahead to the 13th century. Here we have Madonna and Child again. Um, some of you are probably keying in on a very important paradox of the Renaissance. And if that's true, great. It means, it means you've really been paying attention. One of the arguments that I made about the Renaissance is the Renaissance is a change in value. And we're going from a God-centered world to a man-centered world. At the same time, you're probably noticing that most of these paintings have a very religious subject matter. You know, we're seeing paintings of Jesus, we're seeing paintings of Mary. What's the deal with that? I thought you said, Rich, that secularism was one of the values of the Renaissance. And that's true. But two things. First, just because it's a secular, uh, a, we're, we're Entering a more secular period doesn't mean we're entering a period absent religion. A lot of these painters are incredibly religious and incredibly spiritual in their own lives. Nobody was more religious than Michelangelo. Another thing is these are artists and they're, they're trying to get gainful employment. So almost none of these guys are painting for themselves. The, the idea of the painter, you know, locked up in a room creating masterpieces that no one will ever, no one will ever buy, you know, uh, Vincent van Gogh is a long way away. So all of these people are employed by somebody and their patron gets to tell them generally what to paint. And the most popular uh, paintings were all religious in nature. And the most popular religious paintings depicted Mary or Mary and Jesus. So we'll see a, a number of different versions of Madonna. Uh, my favorite is Pieta, which is the depiction of Mary uh, with Jesus after he's taken down from the cross. But here we have an interesting painting and it's Mary and Jesus. Now, while this was the most popular form of painting, Patrons would go to their artists and say, this is what I want you to paint. I'm commissioning a new altarpiece or I'm commissioning a new fresco uh, in, in some church. And I would like it to be a depiction of Mary and Jesus. While this was the most popular, it was also the most difficult. Mary is a very difficult figure to paint. And Jesus is a very difficult figure to paint. And if you take a look at this, this painting by Chimboy, you'll figure out why. 
Mary is, uh, in the Catholic tradition, this eternal virgin. And so when we depict her at different stages in her life, it's very difficult to capture that youth and virginity but also the wisdom and the sadness. And, and many artists struggle with it. Uh, it takes a special kind of artist to get it right. No one ever got it as right as, as Leonardo da Vinci uh, and Michelangelo. And we'll take a look, at, uh, we'll take a look at, at some of their Madonnas when we get deeper into the high Renaissance. And if there's anyone more difficult to paint than Mary, it's Jesus. Take a look at, at the infant Jesus there. You know, you're trying to paint a baby who is more or less an anatomically correct baby, but you're also trying to convey the wisdom that comes with this is this is the son of God. Um, and so usually they get it wrong. And so here, here's an example of Chimboe just trying and getting it wrong. Chimboe was the, the most famous artist of his age. And he's the guy who discovers the first true Renaissance artist. We'll get to that guy in a second. But uh, I always thought that this, this portrayal of Jesus in Madonna Enthroned looks a lot like uh, Larry Fine from the Three Stooges. Does anybody else see it? Okay, we can, go and see, uh, we can go and see this painting at Uffizi in Florence. And I, uh, I encourage everyone to get there. I'll actually have a, a walking tour of Uffizi for you later in the course. Here's another example of uh, a Madonna enthroned painted by Chimboe in 1291. So we're, we're looking at the end of the 13th century. Here is a close up. So as an altarpiece, you could take these things down, you can move them, they were like screens. Uh, this particular one is uh, oil on wood. Let me also point out the, uh, here's a, here's a Jesus that is, you know, look, he's an infant, he's one years old, but look at the, look at the very adult like gesture that he's making. The thing that he's doing with his hands is called a rabbinical pose. When people paint Jesus during the Renaissance, very often you'll see him making that pose. That's a teaching pose. And notice between uh, Jesus and uh, Mary and all the saints, they're all crowned with halos. And that's a symbol of sanctity in the Catholic tradition. All right. A couple of artistic effects that we're going to see used by artists like Chimboe and his famous protege during this period. This is, what, this is what marks a difference between Renaissance art and art that came before it. So the, the fundamental problem, and anybody that's ever drawn anything, you know, when you were a kid and you were trying to make a three-dimensional box on a uh, two-dimensional sheet of paper, one of the difficulties is how do I, how do I portray three-dimensional realism or depth on a two-dimensional wall? or a two-dimensional canvas. And so artists begin developing tricks that still are used today, but here they are during the Renaissance developing. The first one I'll ask you to look for is something called chiaroscuro. And chiaroscuro is the use of light and shade and darkness to give the appearance or give the illusion of having volume or depth. Let's take a look and go back. Take a look at Mary's chin. Underneath Mary's chin, do you see how it gets darker? Or to the left side of Jesus's chin, do you see how it seems to get darker? That gives the illusion of fullness. That gives the illusion of volume. Now, the first time you probably looked at this painting, you didn't notice it straight out, but it did look more three-dimensional than say the Byzantine mosaic that I showed you. If you want, just go back and, and rewind it to the, to the Byzantine mosaic. You'll see what I mean. So even though it's two-dimensional, it's giving you the idea that there's some volume there, some depth there. The other thing is smafuto. Smafuto 
when I'm teaching this to, to undergrads, I, I, I try to, the, the hack that I give them is if smofuto smout sounds like smoky, that's how you remember it. Smofuto is the blending of color and the, and the blending of that shade to soften the edges of a figure to again, give it that sense of uh, sense of volume. If I can start blending colors together to give it like the illusion of depth. So here are two early techniques that artists are using. My dividing line between the late Middle Ages and the beginning of true Renaissance art is this relationship between Chimboe, the artist I just showed you, uh, who painted in Florence and Northern Italy, and Chimboe's protege. And that is Giotto. So the story of Giotto is pretty interesting. Giotto was a, uh, a sheep herder. And I'm not sure how true this story is or how apocryphal it is, but according to legend, Cimboe, this Florentine artist who's famous in his own day, is walking from town to town and he sees a shepherd boy sketching a sheep, you know, on a rock. And he notices how realistic this sheep is. And so he adopts the kid and takes them into his studio and begins teaching him everything he knows about art. And then Giotto's fame eventually. Uh, eclipses Chimboy's. So we'll take a look at this painting. This is my favorite Giotto. You can see this in Padua. Um, it's called Christ Entering Jerusalem. It tells a very important uh, the story of, of Jesus on his way to his own crucifixion. Painted around 1305, 1306. So we're only talking about uh, 15 or 16 years after the last painting that I showed you. And take a look at all of the different techniques that Giotto uses to give the appearance of depth. So that, that castle wall in the back, which by the way is completely anachronistic. Jerusalem in the uh, first century AD didn't look anything like uh, that. That is a medieval, that, that, that style is realistic because that was what an Italian wall or the, the walls outside of an Italian town like like Florence or Siena may, have, might have looked like. Uh, so Giotto is painting what he sees. He's painting what he knows. But we see that wall in the background and the, uh, the people climbing those uh, olive groves in the background. And notice how small the wall is relative to Christ and to uh, the donkey that he's riding. And notice how, those, how small the people in the background are. That kind of linear perspective gives us the illusion of three dimensions or depth. You know, if there's somebody standing three feet in front of you and someone standing 50 feet in front of you, that person three feet in front of you is going to look way taller than the person 50 feet away. The person 50 feet away is going to look really tiny. And it's not because they are tiny. It's because that's, that's the nature of linear perspective. So by, by making figures in the background small and buildings in the background small and people in the foreground large, he gives us the appearance of depth. It's revolutionary. Now, when I showed you the stained glass window and when I showed you the mosaic, Theodora or Mary was the most important, powerful figure in, in the work of art. Your eyes are immediately drawn to that person because of the size. Here too, Jesus is the largest person in the painting. But why is Jesus the largest person in this painting? I mean, we, the effect is the same. Jesus is the most powerful person, important person in the painting. But how does he do it? Rather than simply making him giant size, he puts him way in the foreground. So naturally, he's going to appear larger than the figures around him. But the effect is still the same. So there's Jesus. There he is with his rabbinical pose, uh, almost like a three-quarter view. And he's riding a donkey. I love the donkey in this painting because he looks like the donkey from Shrek. Maybe it's just me. Uh, the other anachronistic thing about this painting is that all of the clothing is clothing that you would have seen in 13th and 14th century Italy, not first century Jerusalem. But again, Giotto is going for realism here. 
just a remarkable, remarkable painting. Uh, here's another one. The Badia polyptic is part of a, so a polyptic is uh, basically a bunch of panels that you would assemble together either as a standalone or as an altarpiece. So if, if you hear, if you hear me use the word diptych, it, it's two of these things put together. Um, there have been some famous triptychs. We'll take a look when we get to the Northern Renaissance at Hieronymus Bosch's famous triptych. And that's three panels put together. Any more than three, it's a polyptych. And this one's the body of polyptych. Uh, and we're starting to see some real realism in people's faces. So you can also see this at Uffizi. And I encourage everyone, obviously there's no homework, but I encourage everyone to, uh, to click on the link that I'm going to provide and take a walking tour of Uffizi and let me know if you can find it. The most famous writer of the 13th century kind of noticed this transition that we're making between Chimboe and Giotto. So Dante Alighieri wrote this medieval epic about uh, a personal journey, first through hell, where he's, he's guided through hell by the Roman poet Virgil, and then he goes to purgatory, and then finally to, uh, to heaven. And that, that epic work was called the Divine Comedy. You probably have heard about the version where he, he and Virgil go traveling through hell and see all the, the souls of the damned. That's called Dante's Inferno. Uh, but Inferno was followed by Paradiso, or I'm sorry, da Purgatory. Uh, Inferno was followed by uh, Purgatorio, which is his journey through Purgatory, and then Paradiso, which is his journey through heaven. But in Purgatory, he makes uh, he makes reference to both Chimboe and Giotto, and he says that Chimboe uh, used to be the greatest painter in all of Florence, but now Giotto is the person that that everybody says is the greatest painting, uh, the greatest painter in all of Florence. So, Dante, and interesting when we talk about the change in Renaissance values. Here we are at the end of the 13th century, and Dante isn't writing in Latin. He's writing in the vernacular. So the Divine Comedy, if you wanted to read it, it's actually in Italian. This is a pretty interesting painting by Giotto I wanted to show you, and we'll take a look at some of the, uh, some of the different aspects of this painting. So... One is, uh, first, if you wanted to see this painting, also you'd have to go to Padua. I, tr I tried to limit myself to the Uffizi, but I really wanted to, to for this part of the, the tour, but I really wanted to show you this painting. So here we are in Northern Italy. Um, this is called The Adoration of the Magi. Uh, it tells the story in the Bible right after Jesus was born in a manger. The, the three wise men from the East come and they pay homage to, uh, to, the, to the infant Jesus. Some really interesting or cool things about this painting. One is the style. So the last few paintings that I showed you were oil or oil tempura on uh, wood. This is, a, uh, this is a form of art called fresco. Fresco is when you take paint and apply it directly to wet plaster. So you paint over a wall and then while the plaster is fresh and has not dried, you apply the paint directly to that pl a plaster. The word fresco sounds like the English word fresh. That's how I remember what it is. So this is fresco. Um, another good example of fresco would be the... Uh, the Last Supper by Da Vinci in Milan, or in Rome, the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel is fresco. The thing about fresco is it's painted directly onto the wall, so they could never move this. If you wanted to move this to a more famous gallery, you would have to literally chisel away the wall. 
And, and we don't do that with Fresco. So wherever it's done is, is kind of where we leave it. And also it's very hard to, to restore. So you'll notice that there's whole sections of the, uh, of, of the work that have kind of chipped away. That bright blue, by the way, is lapis lazuli. And one of the things that marks Renaissance art is this trade between Italy and the rest of the, uh, the rest of the world. They're importing new gems and new precious stones that they can crush and turn into colors for, for their, uh, for their art. So this is a really bright popping blue that we're going to see used later in Renaissance art. Same thing with the gold that frames the halo of the three wise men and the Holy family and, and Jesus. So, uh, the thing with Renaissance realism is they would draw upon what they knew. So take a look at the groom. The groom is, is the person attending to the animals. Um, the face looks really realistic. He used an actual model to come up with that face. Look at the two camels. Do the camels look realistic? No, it's very obvious that Giotto had never seen a camel, but he wanted to add uh, an aspect of realism. So rather than use horses, he wanted to include camels. Do you notice the chiaroscuro here? So some of the beams in this manger are bright and some of them are dark. The dark suggests they're the ones in the back. So, you know, using the shade and using the shadow, we get the illusion of a building having three dimensions. A little bit of chiaroscuro and a little bit of smafuto at work here. If you're familiar with the story from the Bible, uh, the three wise men or the three kings from the east were guided to Bethlehem where Jesus was born by the appearance of a star. So not really sure what the star was. People that have tried to dig into this say, is it, is it a supernova? Or was it a, uh, you know, was it, was it, was it a planet in some kind of alignment? Um, Giotto had actually seen Halley's Comet. So we're pretty sure that he, he depicted the 1301 arrival of Halley's Comet as the, the star from the east that guided the three wise men to, uh, to Jesus's uh, manger in Bethlehem which is pretty cool. All right, so there's Donatello. We'll get to Donatello and Donatello's David uh, when we start getting into the high Renaissance. Uh, but for now, I just wanted to show you guys some, uh, the, the transition between art of the Middle Ages and then art of the early Renaissance. And the two artists that we looked at were Chimbue and Giotto.